Hi everyone, Marisol Castro here being joined by the newest catcher to our New York Mets, none other than James McCann. James, welcome to New York. First of all, where were you when you got the call? And what excited you most about coming to the New York Mets? Oh shoot, when I got the first, when I, when I got the call telling me that, that things were pretty much final, I was actually standing over the stove making pancakes for my boys for breakfast. Um, and my mother-in-law was visiting and uh, I had to pass the pancake making duties off to her to, to go take the phone call and, and talk. Um, and uh, I was, I mean, I was very happy. I was excited. I was, I mean, words don't really describe it. I really don't think it's even set in yet, to be honest with you. Well, we're, we're happy that those pancakes resulted in your coming here. So, and I bet they were really delicious. What was your interaction with Steve Cohen at that point? Um, so I actually haven't, haven't interacted with him yet. Um, I've just kept up with him on uh, social media and uh, I mean, really just news around baseball. I feel like he has just completely rejuvenated uh, the, the Mets and, and the Mets faithful. And um, I mean, he's just, I think w what he's doing is going to be phenomenal, not, not just for the Mets, but really for the game of baseball. I would, I would tend to agree with you. And I don't say that just because he's everyone's boss. Uh, you, you mentioned you mentioned social media. He's pretty prolific on social media, and we at the Mets we like to welcome our new players with open arms. Um, have you have you taken a look at the reaction to you on social media? Anything stand out? Um, I have looked at it a little bit, uh, but to be honest with you, I've just like I said, I've been things have been so hectic. Um, I, I still haven't responded to some of my teammates that have posted stuff. My new teammates that have posted stuff on social media. Um, so I, I, I do expect here in the next few days as things to slow down to, to really kind of dive in and, and definitely respond to, to my, my new teammates and then hopefully get, to, get some chance to interact with some fans on social media as well. Well, your new teammates are very excited and I'm going to get to one in particular a little bit later on. But I do want to talk about um, your experience before you came to the New York Mets. Um, you're someone who caught Lucas Giolito's no-hitter last season. Very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, what are you doing to prepare to catch a pitcher like two-time Cy Young Award winner Jacob deGrom? Well, I think, uh, well, first off, uh, he's one of several pitchers that I'm glad that I, I get to catch and don't have to hit off of. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, honestly, he, he's a guy that um, I'm, I'm going to talk to and I'm going to reach out to and I'm going to watch his film. But, uh, and, and I hope there's some things here and there that I can help him with. But in, in all reality, uh, the success that he's had at the major league level, especially the last several years, um, it's going to be my job to get on his page and figure out what, what works for him and, and do everything I can not to change anything that he's done because uh, I have a pretty simple adage that you don't need to fix something that's not broke. And, uh, you know, some, someone like him, it's, it's going to be my job to get on his page and, and, and figure him out, uh, you know, more so than him trying to figure me out. Sure. And, I, and the fans are very excited for all of that. And while we're talking of pitchers, what about uh, Syndergaard and Stroman? Uh, again, guys, again, that I'd much rather catch and have to hit off of. Um, Syndergaard, I, I remember facing him in, in double A when I was uh, with Erie and he was with uh, Binghamton. Um, you know, he's, he's a f phenomenal pitcher and I'm excited to get him back. And then Stroman, I, I, faced, again, I faced him uh, through my whole minor career and then in the big leagues as well. And, uh, you know, he's, he, he, He's very, very talented, and, and I, I can't wait to pick his brain. And um, he, he's also very intelligent. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of get to know him and, and the ins and outs of his game as well. You mentioned when I, when I brought up DeGrom, you're happy you don't have to uh, hit against him anymore, but you did get a hit off of him. So what is it like being in the batter's box facing Jacob DeGrom? Uh, a guy like DeGrom is a guy that you, you take your single and you're happy for the day because – there, it's it's just as easy to go 0 for three, 0 for four, with, uh, you know, three or four strikeouts off a guy like him. Um, he's he's a guy you have to take what he gives you, and um, any other type of you know any extra base damage is is really just kind of icing on the cake. Um, I I think I remember the the base hit. I think it was a line drive into left field, and I I think he'd already gotten me out once or twice before I got that hit. Um, that was in 2019. So I it was just kind of one of those moments where it's like, oh, man, I'm I'm glad I don't have to face him again the, the rest of the season. Right. You know, I, I dug into your backstory a little bit, and it is really inspiring all the way from Santa Barbara to here in New York. In 2018, um, you were non-tendered, and then in 2019, you were an all-star. 
what do you attribute that success to? Clearly you work very hard, but I, I, I would like to think that you also really study this game, specifically what you do as a pitcher. And I wonder if you couldn't share that with us. Yeah, so um, really uh, 2018 was, was, was a down year for me. And um, for me, it was, it was I kind of went into the off season I didn't know at the point that at that time I was going to get non tendered, but I knew that I had to make some adjustments. And um, the the thing that that I I kept going back to uh, in and I spent the first two months of that off season watching film and just kind of kind of reflecting on who I was as a player. The thing I kept going back to was I'd gotten away from who James McCann was. Mm-hmm. And so the simple answer is um, I became content with who James McCann is. And uh, I had a, it was a blessing and it was a curse at the same time. I came up playing with some of the game's greatest hitters. I, I got to watch Miguel Cabrera, Victor Martinez, JD Martinez, Ian Kinsler. Um, I played with Cespedes and you know, I, I played with all these, you know, prolific all-star hall of fame type hitters. And I found myself trying to be like them. And, um, my stance kind of got, you know, got changed. My hands changed, everything kind of changed to try and as I was trying to imitate the things that they were doing and, and it wasn't working. Um, and so what, I'd started, I started, I did that off season. I went back to who I was uh, really in the minor leagues. I opened my stance back up. Um, I moved my hands back lower, back to closer to the launch position. And in all reality, I became content taking a single the other way. Um, instead of trying to do damage uh, every time I swung the bat, I, I, came, I became more content that, that James McCann is okay to shoot a single through the, the three, four hole the other way and, and take those singles. And over the course of 2019, those line drive singles turned into line drive doubles, which turned into to oppo homers. Um, and I learned that that less is more and being more content with, with who James McCann is and, and not trying to be somebody that I'm not. I love that. And that's a very mature thing to, to really accomplish as a human being, let alone a baseball player. And I wonder how that translated in the clubhouse um, with your former team. What did you learn about leadership uh, knowing that you worked so hard at being, as you say, James McCann. Well, I think one of the the strengths for me um, as a clubhouse leader is I've I've failed. Um, I can sit down with somebody who has who, who's struggling, and I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to to be in a slump. I know what it feels like not to be f- performing to the ability that you believe that you can perform. Um, and it's hard if you haven't been in those shoes to to relate to somebody. Uh, so that's kind of somewhere where, especially the White Sox, I, I came over in 2019 when they were starting to come out of a rebuild. And then obviously 2020 was, it was the first year where, where we really were out of the rebuild there. Um, but there were young players all around me that, that went through those tough stretches. And I was kind of able to sit there and, and talk to them about, like, you know, you're going to go 0 for 20 again in your career. It, it doesn't matter. I, I've, I've watched Hall of Fame hitters do it. I've watched the best hitters in the game go through slumps. and um, being content with, with being uncomfortable is, is really the key. And, and so being, having been in those shoes, it, it really helps, you know, it, it's not hard to, to, to motivate somebody who's hitting 300 and, and going to be an all-star. It, it's, it's how do you relate to the guys that, that may be going through a tough time. Right. I, I love that. I want to go back to this teammate that I mentioned earlier in the interview, one Jeff McNeil, we know him as the flying squirrel. Uh, tell us, tell us about your relationship with him from Santa Barbara to the All Star Game, and now sharing yeah. sharing the ballpark. So uh, we we grew up playing the same little league. Um, you know, I I I don't have any vivid rem- memories of, of us in little league together. I think I'm a little bit older than him, um, so I think I was always kind of one division ahead of him. But our families are friends. You know, we his mom was was really involved in the little league. My mom was really involved in the little league. Um, so we were, you know, we were just always kind of around each other. Um, and then we, we kind of lost touch, and especially since – and I don't want to get the story wrong, but I think he, he quit baseball in high school and then and, – and was a golfer, and I know he's an, an unbelievable golfer to this day. And then next thing you know, he comes back, plays high school his last year or whatever it is, and he's a stud in college, and next thing you know, he's in the big leagues. Um, so just watching his success story, that's, that, that's pretty neat. And then – just out of nowhere in 2019, I, I don't think our Little League had ever produced a, a Major League All-Star. And the next thing you know, that, you know, we're playing the same All-Star game. It, it, was, it was pretty special, especially seeing his family there and then, you know, getting pictures with him on the field. That was, that was a lot of fun. He was so jazzed, so jazzed during that, that All-Star. 
Have you, uh, I know, and, and I know you've said that things are happening so quickly at rapid speed, but have you had any chance to speak to McNeil or any other of your, your new Met teammates? So I, I haven't spoken to, to Jeff yet. Um, uh, Conforto reached out to me uh, yesterday, I think it was. We, we spoke a little bit. Um, but uh, I actually train in, in the off season with Steven Matz and Brad Brock. Uh, so they, you know, they had, had read the rumors online and they were trying to get info out of me left and right uh, pretty much for, for five or six days leading up to, to the official announcement. Um, so I, I, have, I have communicated with them. And, and I mean, I, like I said, I've trained with them for the last three years. So uh, I, I, I already feel lucky to have a, a good relationship with those guys. What would you like... Uh, Met fans to know about you as a player because I don't know if you're aware New York fans we are so tough but we love hard we want nothing more than a success story and so what would you like the fans to know about you well I think um, the, the the thing about me that I, I I would love for every fan to know is that that there's no one that's ever going to outwork me um, you know, I know that I know the expectations that, that come in, you know, playing in New York. Uh, but as as high as those may be, there there's no one that has higher expectations for for my performance than I do for myself. Um, and I, I can I can guarantee I, I can't guarantee championships. I can't guarantee uh, you know hit every at bat or you know any of that type of stuff. I know what what I'm working towards. I know that that I signed up to to play for this organization to win championships. But one thing that I know I can guarantee is is that no one will outwork me and no one will be more prepared than I will be. And uh, that, that's something that I, I want, I want to, to rub off on other teammates in, in that clubhouse is that, uh, you know, we, we have the talent. Now, now I think we, uh, we, we take it to the next level and, and, and outwork everybody to, to get to where we want to be. And to that point about working hard, and you mentioned earlier that you really focused on yourself and who you were as a player, as a baseball player, and you worked really hard on your swing and you changed your stance. I wonder if you don't mind talking about your work defensively as a catcher. Yeah, so um, I I pride my, my, my game on my defense. Uh, that's how I've been ever since I started catching and and uh, especially when I got to college and, and learned the importance of of managing a pitching staff and, and calling a game and um, just all the ins and outs of, of being a catcher. And, and the most important thing is being the general on the field. Uh, like you said, I, I have a bird's eye view of everything. I'm the only guy in the field that sees every position. Um, and for me personally, um, if you look back at all the, the teams that have won a World Series, you can't say that a team has won without a, without a catcher that knows how to run a game. Um, so that, like I said, that's where I pride my game. Uh, Throwing-wise, that, that's something I've always taken, taken pride in. Um, I mean, I love hitting homers. I love uh, doing all that stuff. But throwing, there, there's just something about throwing a runner out that, that is different than all of it. I, I love being able to throw out a runner. Um, so I, I do take a lot of pride in that. Uh, but I take a lot of pride in, in the other aspects too. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've really worked hard on the last, really the last year, especially is my framing. And um, I, I really dove into how catchers score well in the framing department and, and what is the difference. And I, I sought out uh, outside help in, in Jerry Naren and we, we worked on my framing and um, I was able to see the results this year in, in 2020. And I look to, to continue that trend in 2021 and beyond. Well, we're also very excited to see it. I did want to get to your charity work because I know you are involved in a lot of philanthropy. And what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, one thing that, that my wife, Jessica, and I take a lot of pride in is, is being involved in the community. Um, the, the, the biggest thing right now that, that we've been involved in the last few years uh, since our, we had twin boys that were born 10 weeks premature in 2017. And uh, we spent seven weeks in the Vanderbilt NICU um, with them is they're, they're both born and they're less than three pounds. So we, we experienced life of, of uh, being in children's hospital and being in, in the NICU for, for seven weeks um, through the Christmas time frame. So we were, you know, we saw, we saw a lot of things while we were there and we, we knew at that moment in our lives that, that this was kind of our calling and this was, you know, where we were going to use our platform to give back. So we do a lot of stuff um, here at the Vanderbilt NICU where we, uh, you know, we go and visit, and then we also um, we'll, we'll give out Mother's Day, Father's Day, and, and then Christmas gifts uh, to the parents that are quote unquote stuck in the in the NICU with their children for those those time periods. Um, and then we also like to to adopt a, a hospital in the cities that we play in and kind of do the same thing. Um, so that's something I, I look forward to to get involved in in New York is uh, finding those hospitals with the NICU and 
um, and just kind of giving back to to where we've we've come from and and our boys are are a testament to the the miracle that they they do in the NICU and, and seeing them grow and seeing where they are three years after after we spent a significant amount of time there it's it's pretty special. I would say so from the NICU to getting daddy's pancakes the day he finds out he's a New York Met that's not mm -hmm. a bad life so far for three years old. <laughs> yeah no, they're they're doing good they're doing really well. Excellent. Uh, qu another few rapid fire questions. You don't have to think about them too hard. I know you come from the land of deep dish pizza, but there is nothing like a slice from New York. So Chicago deep dish or New York slice? I'm gonna have to go to New York slice. I like the way this is going. What's your favorite food? Uh, I got to go barbecue. Ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, dry rub or like a wet soppy uh, sauce? Depends on the mood that I'm in. I, I, I like them both. All right, I like it. Uh, favorite non-baseball activity? I like to hunt, especially deer hunting. Excellent. Best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, the best piece of advice I've ever received is, uh, is, don't, is every day that you're not working, someone else is working harder than you. So don't be outworked. That's kind of been my motto my whole life. Here, here. Uh, what's your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure. Uh, so I, I, I'll give a backstory. But my guilty pleasure is, is drinking a Dr. Pepper. Um, and my, my, my backstory is uh, I, gave up, I gave up soda and soft drinks when I was like in fifth grade because I, I was going to play in the major leagues and I felt like soda was going to deter me and make me unhealthy. So I gave it up. And to this day, the only soft drink that I'll drink is, is a Dr. Pepper. But I literally gave up soda till I was – I think I was in the minor leagues until I was in the minor leagues and I was tired one day and someone handed me a Dr. Pepper and said, drink this. It'll make you hit a homer. I hit a homer that night. And so since then I've, my guilty pleasure is drinking a Dr. Pepper. Duly noted. We will know what to have in the clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of music do you like? And do you have a favorite band? Um, I usually lean towards, towards uh, country music. And I, I just kind of listen to it all. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I have a favorite, favorite artist. Okay. Are you currently binge watching anything? And if so, what is it? Um, well, we're, my wife and I were waiting for it to come back, uh, but we are huge Blacklist fans. Um, oh, look at you. I was not yeah. expecting that. Yep. Yep. So well we, done. Uh, we binge watched it and now we're up to date and we were, I say patiently awaiting. There's not a lot of patience. We, we want it back. <laughs> Do you guys watch together or do you ever watch separately and then you have to lie about being an episode ahead? No, together. together. I love That's, that. That, make, yeah. that makes me happy. <laughs> what is your favorite thing to do on your day off? Um, I like to sleep. I, I do like to sleep. And then uh, if we're at home, I like to spend time with my kids and my wife. If we're on the road, um, I like to sleep some more. <laughs> <laughs> what is your pregame ritual? Uh, my pregame ritual, every before every game where I'm playing, it's a uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a banana, and a blue Gatorade. That's, that's my, my every, every pregame meal. PB&J, banana, blue Gatorade. Got it. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is tough. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No, it's a hot dog. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> we, can all, we can all sleep well now. <laughs> James McCann, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. On behalf of all of us here at the New York Mets, thanks so much for joining our chat with our newest catcher, James McCann.